Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Just the Worst Podcast. This one, episode number 14, to be perfectly exact. And as usual, I'm your host, Billy Donnelly, who you can find at JoeBlow.com. This is Infamous, and of course, right here at Just the Worst Podcast. And as usual, like we do week in and week out, like to talk about movies, talk about the industry of Hollywood and everything that's going on. And uh, there's a few things that I'm going to get to. There's a few things on the docket for this week. A few things I have right here in my rundown, in my queue. But let's not beat around the bush here. Everyone, the main focus that everyone is paying attention to, the main source of attention that everyone is keyed in on is the release of Star Wars The Force Awakens. By the time you hear this podcast, the movie is here. It has arrived. It will be in theaters. The first wave of those 7 o'clock shows will be history. Will have come and gone. And people will have witnessed, experienced, taken in, absorbed the next chapter, the next episode of the Star Wars saga. Now, I'm not going to review the movie here on this show. I have seen the movie. I've seen it for a few days. I've seen it. If you want to know a spoiler-free review of the film... You can go ahead to the This Is Infamous YouTube page. Find one there. It's there. It's there. And I and I promise you, I'm not I'm not just bullshitting you. I'm not lying to you to get you to view it. It is spoiler free. It is vague. It is generic. But you'll get my basic impressions of the film right there. If that's what you're curious about, you'll get them right there. I got a more spoiler-filled episode of Just the Worst Movie Review Podcast coming up. It'll be up before the weekend hits. And for for those of you who have seen it, who want to kind of get a little bit more in-depth, want to hear the film spoken about at length, that's where you that's what you want to hear. Dive right in, you'll be able to hear plenty about it. But I'm going to warn you in advance, if you haven't seen the film, don't listen to it. Don't make that choice. I don't care how curious you are, don't make that choice until you've seen the film, and then we get into it. But I thought, here to kind of open the show, uh, before we kind of, you know, deal with the the business, the other business... And, and put some of that into context. I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story. About my Star Wars The Force Awakens experience. As I sit here slightly under the weather. Got a little bit of a cold. A little bit of sniffles. So if you hear those every once in a while. I apologize. But I wanted to tell you a story. About my Star Wars The Force ex- Awakens experience. And sort of what I've been going through leading up to watching the film. And it very well may fall in line with what you've been going through. Now, I haven't been watching too much. I saw the two trailers and that was it. An early teaser trailer we got, on, I think, on, uh, what was it, like Black Friday last year? And then the one we got a little bit further along. Beyond that, uh, not too much. I haven't really been watching the TV spots. 
when they come on the TV when I'm watching something, I kind of just look away. I pay no attention to them, and I just kind of like like peek out of the top of my eyelids, glancing at them for when they're gone, because I didn't want to see too much. I haven't been reading too much. I haven't been seeking out too much information. For me, going into the theater when I saw it, I wanted that to really be the brunt of my experience. I wanted to sit down in the theater and let it just kind of unfold. Let it wash over me. Let it play. And bring, or not bring, the magic that I was hopeful it would. And, you know, I've been seeing here kind of week in and week out. Don't get too excited, right? Don't get too crazy about this. Don't go too nuts for this in advance. Because A, you're just going to burn yourself out quite a bit. On top of that, you were going to raise the bar so high for yourself that the the movie was going to have difficulty reaching that. It was going to be tough. It was going to be tough to hit that. Because you couldn't go into a movie like this saying, oh my God, it's going to be great. It's going to be the most amazing movie that was ever created. You can't do that. It's how you set a movie up for failure. Because how is it supposed to be that? Even if it's really good, how is it supposed to be that? So I've been telling everyone, you know, let's just relax. Let's go in. Let's hope for the best. Let's not go crazy. And I, myself was able to to stick with that quite a bit. Now, there was a lot of talk prior to the release of the film that Disney was Disney slash Lucas film was not going to show this thing for anybody. That they were... They didn't need to. That they didn't need to show this thing, get any type of critical response or reviews for it, because it's Star Wars. It's critic proof at this point. At this point, I think there's something like $100 million in pre-sale tickets heading into... The first show. And tons of people I know, tons of my colleagues ran out and they bought up all these tickets because they didn't want to be left out. They wanted to make sure they were right in there at 7 o'clock for the first showing. And I never caved. I never caved. I never bought. I was waiting. I was waiting because I felt it. In my gut, I felt it in me that they were going to show us this thing. We were going to get to see it at some point. And about a week ago, in my email box, comes the notice that Star Wars will be shown. An advanced screening, a a media screening, a press screening of Star Wars The Force Awakens will be lined up for us to see. And not everybody was going to see it. Supposedly they were going to be very careful about who was selected to see it. And there were all sorts of rules going in. Mainly that we had to be able to go see it by ourselves. No guests, no plus ones, no taking anybody with us, just 
me, myself, and I, along with whoever else was allowed in the theater on that particular occasion. And, you know, it kind of bummed me out a little bit because I have two kids and they have gotten incredibly into Star Wars. I mean, they watch it all the time. They watch the original trilogy. The prequels, not so much. Not because they didn't like them. Uh, Revenge of the Sith kind of devastated them. I mean, they were really upset that the Emperor tricks Anakin Skywalker at the end of that movie. Really upset. For a six and a three-year-old, really hit them hard. But so they watch that. And they watch Star Wars Rebels. And now they're watching Star Wars Clone Wars. And they've watched the droid tales. I mean, they're into it. I even think they may have surpassed where I was when I was a kid watching Star Wars. Now, I had all the action figures. I knew all the characters. I knew Star Wars inside and out, and I watched the movies a ton. But I also didn't have access to it like I do now, where I could just call upon Star Wars and watch it every day if I want to. Back then, if you did watch it every day, I mean, you, you had to wear out that VHS but first, you had to get a hold of a VHS copy. Sometimes you just record it off the TV. Let me let me tell you how big fans these kids are, okay? So every year for the holidays, my family goes to to Disney World. This is our, our like our big annual holiday tradition. So you go to Disney World, we do Disney, we do the holidays in Disney, right before Christmas, with the lights and the candlelight procession, and the, you know, every, everything's decorated, it, 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 it takes the magical sense of Disney and, and takes it up a notch, even further. So this year we go, and you know there's going to be Star Wars all over the place, and, and you know, this is after they've been watching and watching and watching, and so... The final day that we're there, we go to Hollywood Studios. And they have a brand new section, uh, you know, in addition to Star Tours. And this is going to be my daughter who's three. This is going to be her first time riding Star Tours. First time she was big enough to be able to ride it. And I thought she would get a kick out of it. But on top of that, as they get ready for construction, head off and, and make their Star Wars land, um, they have this new attraction set up called the Star Wars Launch Bay. Which you go in, they have all kinds of props and uh, interactive games and whatnot for for anybody uh, who wants to take part in it. And in addition to that, it, it, you can go and interact and meet with a pair of characters. One being Darth Vader and the other being Chewbacca. So, you know, we did we did Chewbacca, we did Darth Vader first. And my daughter just didn't want any part of it. I mean, she she was terrified. <laughs> she she hid behind the photographer or wanted no part of it. And it's really cool. He's interactive, kind of threatens you with where the rebel plans. It's a really cool thing. So if you get a chance to, to pop in there and, and meet Darth Vader, uh, you're gonna want to go ahead and do that. And Chewbacca is a little less interactive because, you know, what what can Chewbacca really do? But, you know, he talks, he, he does his Chewbacca kind of roar, and he shakes your hand, and, and it's cool. And uh, outside, there are some uh, First Order Stormtroopers patrolling, and, and that was cool as well. And everybody kind of got a kick out of that. But inside of the Star Wars launch bay, there's Jawas that roam around. And you can actually trade with the Jawas. So, you know, the the uh, Disney cast member informs us of this. So we try to figure out, like, what what can we give to the Jawa? Like, what can we try to trade with the Jawa? Because apparently, like, they're always looking for a good trade. So somebody pulls out, like, a plastic spoon that we, for some reason, held on to. 
and my son trades with the Jawa, and he gets back uh, like the dome of a, of a of a toy droid, like the top of a toy droid. So I thought that was cool. Now my daughter is trying to trade with him as well, and he's not really having any of it. Tries to trade him like a mint, like an individually wrapped mint. Doesn't want it. Uh, granola bar doesn't want it. Piece of plastic doesn't want it. I don't even remember what we finally got a hold of that the Jawa wanted, but he took it and gave back uh, a sticker. And and my daughter was uh, was was really just over the moon about the fact that that she was able to make a trade with the Jawa. But the Jawa walks away, okay, in the middle of the Star Wars launch bay, and my kids proceed to follow the Jawa, walk up on him, and yell Utini at the Jawa. And then at that point. The Jawa looks at them, throws up both arms above his head in 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 like triumph or celebration or whatnot, and my kids get the biggest kick out of it. Now, here's where it cycles back to me. I don't know what the hell any of this means. Me, the lifelong Star Wars fan, who used to know all the action figure names, he used to know all the characters, all the all the the most trivial, mundane things. And here, I had no idea what the hell just happened. So now, I, I asked them, well, what are you talking about? What, what did you say to them? And they go, we said, Utini. I don't know what the hell that means. So I have to take out my phone and do a Google, a Google search for Jawa Utini. Now, if you go back into uh, Star Wars, the original Star Wars, when the Jawas capture R2-D2 in A New Hope, Utini is what they yell out. It, in in doing my research now, it mean it, it's basically like the Jawa battle cry, or it means like wow, it's, it's a it's an exclamation of excitement. So when my kids drop Utini on a real life Jawa, needless to say, I'm impressed, and I'm taken aback. So cycling back to the Force Awakens, I was kind of bummed that I was going to have to see this movie myself because I really wanted to be able to kind of share this initial moment with them because at this point Star Wars is not going to be just for me Star Wars is going to be theirs too and you know I'm going to be excited about it and I'm going to be into it but they're going to be so much more excited about it so much more into it than I am now. They're going to be at that point where I was, but further along. Because even when I was a kid, I didn't know Utini. But, with that being said, I still went <laughs> to the movie. Because, look, uh, the 7 o'clock show... Would I have liked to be there with everybody? Uh, maybe. I know it's going to be crazy. I know it's going to be bedlam. I know it's going to be madness. And I don't know that I really wanted to just jump right into that again. Because I've been there before. I'm kind of over it. I'm kind of. I feel. I feel like I'm too old for it at this point. I just. I don't want to wait in the lines and. I I typically don't like going out to the movies too much with the general public because people can't ever behave themselves. Somebody's always got to be on their goddamn Instagram or whatever the fuck they're doing at this point, and they can't ever just let themselves just fall into the movie, just let the movie take them over. And as much as I wanted to share in that moment with my kids, there was a part of me that just had to be selfish and try to watch the the movie 
the first time under the most optimal conditions possible. You know, phones are checked at the door. Security is there to make sure nobody's fucking around. And I wanted to at least be able to witness it the first time under conditions where I know mature adults were going to behave so I could see where we were at here. I lived through the prequels. I was there. I walked out feeling like something wasn't right. And nobody wanted to talk about it. Everybody felt weird. Like there was something wrong with them. Because they weren't crazy about the Phantom Menace. It wasn't until like two weeks later when like the first person broke that everybody just jumped on the bandwagon and was like, oh, you didn't like it either? And suddenly... That became a thing. So I wanted to to know what we were getting ourselves into here. And, you know, so when I get the first email, when I get the email with the invitation, that was the first time I really started to get excited. That's the first time this kind of hit me that, like, I'm going to see this movie. And then it went away for a little bit. I was excited. It was on the calendar. I was super stoked about it. And it went away. It went away. I I was excited, but it went away. It wasn't here yet. And it wasn't until the day came that it really hit me again. That this was the day I was going to see a new Star Wars movie. And I got in my car and I started driving to the theater. And I was feeling good and feeling pumped. Got some good tunes on. All kind of upbeat, exciting stuff. I'm feeling, it's feeding into my mood. And then I pull up to the parking lot of the theater... And I get out of my car and I start I start to take my first steps towards the theater. And that's really where it hit me. I could feel it in my legs. What, what previously had been cautious optimism had now turned into nervous excitement. And I could feel it. I could feel it in my legs. I could just feel like that tingling. That something special was on the horizon. This unique opportunity was waiting for me. I walked up to the theater. I was the first one there. And I checked my phone. I was like, here, take it. And I was giddy. I could feel it and just feel it just coursing through my body. And I was, oh, I was excited about this. This is what Star Wars should always make you feel like. I sat down, I picked out my seat, my dead center perfectly, the seat that I always like to sit in. I was golden, I was ready to go. And the time, the time couldn't have gone any slower. At one point, because I have no phone on me now, I had to check it with security. I asked what time it was. It was 20 minutes after I initially got there. It felt like I was there for goddamn ever. Like I was there for at least 45 minutes. But no. I go to the bathroom. I walk around a little bit. I talk up with some people. How excited this feels. Check again. What time is it? Ten minutes have passed. You gotta be kidding me. This is nuts. So finally... Finally, I get everything, you know, I, 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 I got a soda, I got some popcorn, got some milk duds, I'm ready to go here. Ready to go. 
We sit down and the lights dim. And the Lucasfilm logo comes up. And let me just tell you, man, if you don't get chills throughout your body when that Lucasfilm logo comes up this time, you ain't alive, man. You're not. And when the Star Wars fanfare kicks in and the Star Wars shoots in front of you, oh, it's glorious. It's enthusiasm and excitement run wild. Heading in, I felt like I should want to feel going into a Star Wars. Now, I'm not going to get into my thoughts on the film other than the fact that I really do like it. So if you want if you want anything deeper than that, once again, you got to head over to This Is Infamous YouTube page and watch my spoiler-free review there. Or stay tuned here to Just The Worst Podcast. For the new episode, that will actually be Just the Worst Movie Review Podcast, episode number 12, where we'll get in-depth on Star Wars The Force Awakens, spoilers and all. But I just wanted to convey my th- what it was like kind of going in there and how it felt. And, and now, having seen it, Like, I'm taking the whole family over the weekend. Already got tickets set up for early Saturday afternoon. Taking everybody. And they don't know yet. First, they don't even know that I've seen yet. I tried to keep that a secret. Because I didn't want anybody to get, like, upset or anything that I'd seen it without them. My wife knows, but like the kids don't. But I'm, I, and I haven't even told them that they're going yet on Saturday. That's, I'm saving that one. That's going to be the surprise. I'm just going to drop it on them. And then I can't wait. I can't wait to see first how it plays a second time because while I do really like it, there there are a couple rocky spots for me that I'd like to see how they play a second time. But on top of that, I really want to see how. It plays for them, how they experience it. Whether whether or not they walk out of there like, oh my god, I can't believe I saw this. It's amazing. And have it just just grip them the way that Star Wars gripped me when I was a kid. It's a great time. It is an exciting time. That doesn't mean we need to... You can't go overboard. That's that's the thing. We can't go overboard with it. And, and here's the thing. Please, please, if you have seen it, be careful with spoilers around people who haven't. Let them be able to experience it too. And we'll talk again about it. We'll talk again. And we'll get into it. There will be a time and a place for us to be able to jump right in and discuss this publicly. But for right now, just I, I beg you, just be careful around others who may not have had a chance to see it yet. Maybe they, they, just, they didn't have the opportunity to get out there and see it, those first shows. Maybe they had to wait until Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning or even Monday, maybe. Maybe they just, you know... They're really looking forward to it, but they just, they couldn't, just, just please be careful, all right? That's all I ask, because uh, this is, it's an exciting time. We want everybody, be inclusive, let everybody enjoy the excitement. Don't just try to harness it for yourself. Let's, uh, let's make it something for everybody. All right, that's, uh, that's enough about uh, my experience with Star Wars. Let's talk about somebody else's experience with Star Wars, and and that would be Quentin Tarantino. And, um, yeah, he's not having a really good time with it. So, um, Quentin Tarantino shows up on the Howard Stern show over the past couple days, 
and uh, explains his problem with Disney and uh, ultimately Star Wars. Now, uh, last week, before I headed out on a Disney excursion, broke the story over at JoeBlow.com about uh, the change in the Weinstein Company's release strategy for The Hateful Eight. Now, there were huge problems with them securing uh, theaters that they could retrofit in 70 millimeter in order to be able to show the roadshow version of The Hateful Eight. So the story that I broke was, A, they were moving up the wide release to New Year's Day. It has since been shifted to, I believe, New Year's Eve Day. Or New Year's Eve night. I don't know how they're doing it. Um, and the other thing was that they were now looking into the very distinct possibility that many of the theaters they would be showing, the Roadshow version, would be the DCP version. So the digital projection version of 70 millimeter Roadshow. So there would be theaters that wouldn't be showing it specifically in 70 millimeter, just the digital representation of the 70 millimeter film, the 70 millimeter cut. Now, while I'm in Disney, the Weinstein Company is working overtime to secure theaters that they can now retrofit over the span of like a week and a half. And they managed to find some, including here. In, and, and the reason I know is because, especially in my home area, the Miami Fort Lauderdale area, there was no 70 millimeter theaters set up to show this film on Christmas Day in 70 millimeter. And now I think, I believe there's four. So they, they've been hustling. They've been hustling to try and make this thing happen. To make 70 millimeter happen. And one of the theaters that were supposed to be carrying it was the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood. Which is already set up for 70 millimeter. And now, due to the magnitude, to the massive presence of Star Wars The Force Awakens... That particular theater will not be showing The Hateful Eight. And Tarantino is pissed. Because according to Tarantino, Disney threatened to pull The Force Awakens from all Arclight Cinema locations, with Arclight owning the Cinerama Dome, when they informed Disney that they planned to honor their contract with the Weinstein Company to show the hateful eight in 70 mil- millimeter at the Cinerama Dome. Well, guess what? Disney doesn't give a shit. Disney wants that screen. Why? Because it's Star Wars. And they just want to have it. They want to Force Awakens there all holiday season. They don't give a shit what's playing in 70 millimeter or what has the what's waiting to play in 70 millimeter. They want the Force Awakens on that goddamn screen. And it doesn't matter what Quentin Tarantino wants. It doesn't matter what the Weinstein Company wants. They're going to get it because Star Wars right now reigns supreme. Now, look, I feel bad here for Tarantino. I do, because if Disney is strong-arming the theaters in order to get that screen for their movie, that's no good. That's not okay. Because there are long-term ramifications for that happening, and it's a slippery slope to go down when the studios can really impose their will based off of the product, where they can really dictate the supply and demand system based off of the the films they have that they know the studios want. And we don't want that, especially, look, it's not like you're going to have trouble finding a screening of Star Wars The Force Awakens anywhere. There are some places that are showing around the clock. You want to go at 5.30 in the morning to go watch Star Wars The Force Awakens? You can go watch it there. But for some reason, this place is the sticking point that they want to make sure they have. Now, 
So in that respect, you know, I feel for Tarantino here because he's trying to do something special in his film. And I think that there is a, a, a unique experience to be able to see The Hateful Eight in 70mm, the roadshow version, the way it was shot, the way that they want to project it. I think, though, that there is a different issue to take a look at here, which is basically all of these other films that are coming out this weekend and next weekend that are going to get killed by Star Wars. You just look at this weekend. You have the Zalvin and the Chipmunks movie, and you have Sisters. Two films that, look, there's audiences there for them. There are people who would love to see a Tina Fey, Amy Poehler comedy. And look, the movie's not bad. It's not very good, it, but you will get some laughs out of it. But it's not bad. It's not a bad film. And even as much as we shit on the Alvin and the Chipmunks movies, there's people that go watch those movies. There's a reason that they got to the third one. Because the first two drew big money for 20th Century Fox. So they want to continue to try and tap into that family fair. But with Star Wars dominating the landscape this weekend and then heading into Christmas where you have... I mean, let's just take a look really quickly here at what hits wide on Christmas Day. You have Concussion, the Will Smith football movie, Daddy's Home, the Mark Wahlberg, Will Ferrell movie, Joy, Point Break. You have a limited run of The Hateful Eight. You have a limited run of The Revenant. But guess what? The problem is, and then you even when you look at what's been playing the past few weeks, whether it's The Big Short or In the Heart of the Sea, which sunk quickly, or Krampus. Or any of the movies coming out in November. These are movies that are now getting pushed. Into smaller screens. Because for some reason. Some brilliant genius over at the studio. Thought it would be a great idea to line it up with Star Wars. With the main issue being. That Star Wars is taking up the big houses. The theaters aren't stupid. I mean, even this issue here at the Cinerama Dome, they're not dumb. They know which movie's going to draw better. So why are they going to walk away from it? They're not. Why is any theater going to put Alvin and the Chipmunks in a bigger house... I mean, look, is the movie going to do well? It'll probably do all right in a smaller house. But they're not going to give it a bigger showcase when they have a much better chance of reaping the benefits with Star Wars. I mean, it is what it is. It wasn't smart, I'll tell you that much. Sometimes the studios just don't... You don't have to cram everything into one spot. Spread your movies out around the year. Because especially now, when you have these big franchises, you have these giant shared universes, you have Star Wars, you have Marvel, you have DC building their universe, stay the hell away from those movies. Because these other smaller movies, movies that aren't necessarily established, they're going to get killed. Take a movie and stick it in January. Stick it in September when usually you dump your worst garbage. Put a good movie in there for once. Because it'll clean up. Because people will look around at the other movie and they'll go, Oh, Resident Evil 8? Nah, I think I'd rather watch this other thing. That has the potential to be good. Don't jam all your movies in May, June, and July. Or November and December. Spread them out through the other months and you'll be alright. Why do you think the Fast and Furious... The Fast and Furious movies 
That's where Universal's genius. They took the Fast and Furious movies and they moved them out of the summer. They moved them up. They put them in April. They get a jump start on on the summer blockbuster season. Warner Brothers moved Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice out of the summer when they were trying to go head to head with Captain America: Civil War. They're going what late March. And they're going to clean up for a number of weeks. So get the hell out of these busy times when it's all about ego and prestige. Go somewhere else and your movie will do fine. Don't compete for screens with a movie that you know is going to kick your ass in getting that attention. Just not smart. Just not smart. Speaking of shared universes, though, this, I think, this might be one of the dumbest stories that came across my desk over the course of the week. Because I believe that Paramount and Hasbro are determined to kill the shared universe model. And when I say kill, I don't mean that, like, They want to, like, have it go in its sleep. No, no, no. I mean, they want to, like, grab it behind the head and, like, drown it violently. Like, they want to take a knife and, like, stab it in the neck so it just bleeds everywhere. Everybody wants a shared universe. They look at Marvel and they go, oh, that's, that's, that's it. That's where the money's at. And Star Wars is going to have a giant shared universe beyond the saga with their spinoffs and whatnot. Their standalones. Universal is trying to put together a shared universe with their classic monsters. Everybody wants a shared... Fox wanted a shared universe with the X-Men and Fantastic Four. Everybody wants... A shared universe. Because it it makes people have to come back time and time again to see how it all connects, how it all comes together. But I don't know how the hell this is going to work for Paramount and, and Hasbro as they work together here. And because their plan is to launch a shared universe with G.I. Joe... At the forefront of it. Now, also connecting it to the Micronauts, the Visionaries, Mask, and Rom. Now, I don't know what the hell most of those things are. Mask, I'm vaguely familiar with. I remember watching it as a kid... But if you were to ask me to recall it, uh, I couldn't. I know it had something to do with like cars and motorcycles. Maybe they kind of transform. I don't. I know there's vehicles and people, but I I I don't remember. I remember there was a car. It kind of looked like a DeLorean. I think it could fly. But I don't. I don't fully remember. Exactly what Mask is about. But if you ask me about, like, about the Micronauts or the Visionaries or Rom, I don't know what the fuck those things are. What I do know, though, is based off of the G.I. Joe that we've already got, two films, one now incredibly based around The Rock. I can't see how any of that comes together under the shared universe model with any of these other properties. They just don't make sense. The only way this works, really and truly, is if the G.I. Joe movies are somehow just depictions 
real life depictions of the toys themselves and how they're used. That's the only way I get it, is if the shared universe, it, it kind of goes the route of like the Lego movie, where you realize that everything that's happening is in the imagination of real life people. So like if the rock and his roadblock is actually just a toy, like an action figure, and there's real life people kind of controlling them, and they're bringing the Micronauts and the Visionaries and Mask and Rom all together in kind of this mishmash of action figures, then it might make sense. Then I could maybe buy it. Say, all right, that's creative. Not just because I came up with it, but now at least it gives some type of plausible reason why these different properties, which have no connective tissue whatsoever, would come together here. Because otherwise, it makes zero fucking sense. Zero. And it is it is grasping its trust. It is begging for attention for Paramount and Hasbro to say, let's do a shared universe based on this. I understand you try to branch out, maybe do something with the Transformers. Maybe if you had the Transformers and G.I. Joe come together, maybe that would have made some sense. But Micronauts and the Visionaries and Mask and Rom together with G.I. Joe, zero fucking sense whatsoever. Zero. Zero. Probably less than zero. Like, can, can we go into negative numbers? If we go into negative sense, like, z, like below zero sense, that's where this idea rests. And I don't even mean, like, just below the level. Like, I'm not just talking, like, like negative five cents. It's like negative 57 cents. But it doesn't matter what I say. They're going to try it anyway. They're going to fail miserably. And they're going to look at it. And they're going to throw their hands up. And they go, I don't, I don't know why it didn't work. Because it's stupid. Because now you are you are insulting your audience's intelligence. By saying just by calling something a shared universe. And, throw, and, and connecting them somehow. The people are going to go see it. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it's bullshit. You just think by throwing that name on it. People are going. And I hate to break it to you, but when you spend tons of money, when you spend tons of money, hundreds of millions of dollars to try and make this thing work, and it just goes right into the ground in, in full, spectacular, crash and burn fashion, you just remember that here on this episode, number 14 of Just the Worst Podcast, I told you this was a stupid idea, and it was going to fail, and it was going to be horrible, and it was going to be disastrous, and you didn't listen. Just remember that, for the record, because I'll be here when I told you. A nice silver platter, I'm going to serve it up. Take that. All right, let's get into our uh, our just the worst segment here for, uh, for the week before we start to wrap it up. Uh, every week we like to... Uh, in the true name of the show, I'd like to take just the worst thing that came across um, my desk this week and, and kind of talk about it. And normally it would have been this stupid Hasbro Paramount shared universe uh, with, with G.I. Joe and the Micronauts. But this week we just got, we got a ton of trailers dumped on us um, for, for some really big movies. You know, they're, they're trying to get all of it out and ready and set up. Uh, to, to to mostly get in front of Star Wars: The Force Awakens and get people psyched and jazzed about these flicks uh, when the movie now that the movie is open the, that they would be attached in, in front of Star Wars. So I just kind of wanted to look through them and and see which ones kind of stood out, which ones really kind of popped, as well as which ones were kind of just the worst. So uh, over the over the past few days, a, a number of big ones just hit on us. So. We got a, one, a, a teaser trailer for Star Trek Beyond. We got a teaser trailer for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. We got a, a teaser trailer for Independence Day Resurgent. We got a teaser trailer for X-Men Apocalypse. We got a teaser trailer for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, 2, Out of the Shadows. We got a, a, a trailer for The Legend of Tarzan. And a trailer for Steven Spielberg's adaptation of Raw Dolls, uh, The BFG. 
Now, which one kind of popped for me? I'd really only say one. Uh, maybe two. The BFG, I think, is, is interesting. There's enough to tease you there and keep you curious. And look, it's Spielberg, so you're going to see it anyway. Right? Nobody will, A new Spielberg movie doesn't drop and you go, ah, who the hell wants to see that shit? It doesn't happen. You get ready for it and, and you go see it and you hope that it's one of the really good ones. Because that's what Spielberg is capable of. The X-Men Apocalypse trailer, I think, looks pretty cool. I'm really interested to see where they're going to go with that next. And how they continue to try and build this universe. And also to see who stays around after this thing. You know, is Jennifer Lawrence done as Mystique? Are they going to get Fassbender to kind of stick around as Magneto? What's what's James McAvoy going to do as far as uh, Charles Xavier? Like, how are they bringing this full circle moving forward knowing that the original X-Men cast, they're, they're kind of done with, and it's all about the the first class cast and how they move forward. So I'm interested to see how Oscar Isaac plays uh, as Apocalypse and kind of how they continue to build this, this universe moving forward, uh, stemming from X-Men First Class into uh, X-Men Days of Future Past and now into X-Men Apocalypse. So that trailer uh, caught my eye. <clears throat> Independence Day Resurgence? I don't know. Looks all right. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Independence Day. I think it's kind of dumb when you really take a good look at it. But with that said, I remember seeing the initial trailer, the teaser trailer for Independence Day. It was super excited about it. was super jazzed about it. Why? Because they had these giant ships that were just blowing shit up. When you first watched it, and you watched that giant alien craft take out the White House, you were like, God damn it, I gotta see this movie immediately. You had to wait a few months for it, but you were ready. You were ready in the moment. I'm ready to see this movie right now. The Independence Day Resurgence doesn't really have that same... Feel there are no giant set pieces that they tease at this early point that just stick with you. That you remember. That in front of your eyes, you're like, wow, I gotta see this. Now, who knows if it's gonna shake out story wise. I'm just saying, taking a look at Independence Day Resurgence right now. You know, yeah, it's there as a way to get you excited that it's coming for people who are fans of Independence Day. But I, I just didn't think there was anything that truly popped off this thing uh, to, to make it all that exciting. Then you look at the rest of the trailers, and I just am extremely underwhelmed. For films that are this big, extremely underwhelmed for what these movies are supposed to be. This Star Trek Beyond teaser trailer is just the pits. It's probably the most un-Star Trek looking thing I've ever seen. And that includes the Abrams movies, which are much more Star Wars than Star Trek. And I don't have a problem using the Beastie Boys sabotage, but the way this thing is lined up, I mean, it looks like a Justin Lin Fast and Furious kind of movie. It's cut, it's cut in this very strange action-y kind of way it just it doesn't give off a star trek vibe or feel you know and and once again these are movies that you got to play to the base a little bit those are the people that you got to make sure you get right away immediately casual fans you can get later the people that you're going to get excited with the teaser are the hardcore and if the hardcore look at this and go this is what is this this is star trek then you didn't do your job not at all. Just a very strange trailer for Star Trek Beyond. The Legend of Tarzan? Who want, Does anybody really want to see a Tarzan film? Look, I'll go see it because Margot Robbie's in it. But is anybody looking at this and being like, Alexander Skarsgård is Tarzan? I'm so there. And the trailer just looks weird. It just 
you know, it's one of those, it's another one of those situations where they make it feel dark and gritty and just far too serious. Why doesn't anybody cut trailers that make movies look fun anymore? Because, or at least find the right balance between serious and fun in the same thing. Because you know what happens when you go to the other end and you try to make it look too fun? You get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, which just looks like they just took all kinds of shit and threw it at the wall in the hopes that the people that liked the first one, which are, you know, young kids who don't know any better, are just going to beg their parents to go back and they're going to they're gonna reap all the benefits and all the money in the box office dollars off of that. Because they're, they're throwing everything out on this one. I mean, everything. And I wasn't a fan of the first one. The second one doesn't look all that promising. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a little bit better now that the, the, the world is established. But I don't look at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles out, out of the shadows and, and, and get excited. And I don't do that either for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which is the spinoff of Harry Potter. I don't know anybody who's really getting excited about this, and that includes people who are Potterheads. They don't look at this and go, man, I can't wait to go back into the Wizarding World. And the weird thing about it is that other than the words that kind of flash up on the screen, they don't really give you too much of an indication that this takes place within the same world of Harry Potter which I think for Warner Brothers is a mistake. The Harry Potter series is a huge deal. Play up on it. You don't even have Daniel Radcliffe's face as Harry Potter. Even just opening a book or having somebody to talk to him about opening the textbook of Fantastic Beasts and where to find him and maybe working backwards off of that, that this is how this book came to be? That's a mistake. That's a mistake. And Warner Brothers at some point needs to fix that. Because right now, you look at Fantastic Beasts and where to find them in this early teaser, there's no juice behind it. There's nothing that you look at here and you go, man, can't wait to get my wand and my, my robe on. Feel like I'm at Hogwarts all over again. You don't even get a sense that this world is exciting to go where you visit. It just feels like something that's also just kind of there. And it's not how these extensions of the universe work. You gotta feed off the fandom. Feed off the enthusiasm. You gotta tap into it. And if you ignore it, you ignore it, that's a mistake. The Warner Brothers needs to fix that. Get Harry Potter's face all over that screen. Figure out how to get that to lure people in. Then sell them on whatever else it is that you're selling later. But you gotta draw that Potter connection immediately. immediately all right that's it for the show here this week uh that's it that's we're done we're 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 we're, we're done and we're wrapping it and i'm out which is fine because i'm glad that you took the time to listen to this show while well, you probably waited in line to get into a screening of star wars the force awakens and uh and and i hope i was able to entertain you while you sat before you could go in and, and and hopefully get the best seat available to you, the, the best seat of your choosing. Uh, so in the meantime, let's get through with the plugs. Make sure you hit us up on Twitter at JTW Podcast. That's the official Twitter handle of Just the Worst Podcast. And you can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Just the Worst Podcast. I'm on Twitter as well, so follow me there at Infamous Kid two d's at the end right there and on facebook facebook.com slash billy the kid all the podcasts including this one you can find on soundcloud right now so soundcloud.com do a search for just the worst podcast and all our magnificent podcasts all the various shows that we do on a weekly basis will come up and uh, over the holidays i've been told everything will be uh lined up and arranged so your rss itunes stitcher feeds uh they'll be set up for you to subscribe to so once again just I know I've been saying it for weeks. It's been crazy. We're going to get it done. And uh, and you'll be able to jump right in and uh, and set up all the subscriptions for you. Um, make sure you follow my work, JoeBlow.com, on a daily basis. Also, hit up uh, the YouTube channel for uh, This Is Infamous. That's where you can go right ahead 
and find uh, the spoiler-free video review of Star Wars The Force Awakens. So now that it's, you're in that headspace, jump right over there for that. And, uh, and of course, here at Just The Worst Podcast, you got this one. And stay tuned. We're going to get in-depth, get a little bit spoilery uh, on Just The Worst Movie Review Podcast, the brand-new episode of that. A full hour going to be devoted to Star Wars The Force Awakens. So make sure that you keep an eye out, your ear out, and uh, and be ready for that to come. I've been your host, Billy Donnelly, and uh, I'm going to get out of there. Hopefully you have a great weekend. We'll be back next week uh, as we start to get into the holidays. But uh, we'll, we'll have a show uh, before Christmas uh, hits, so you'll have something to listen to to help get you through the, you know, your whole family dynamic and situation uh, as, as the holidays come about. Um, so, uh, so we will have something there for you there. So be patient. Uh, and, and I'll be back. I'll be back here next week uh, with another episode uh, of Just the Worst Podcast. In the meantime, this has been episode number 14. This one's in the books. This one's over. I'm out. Enjoy Star Wars The Force Awakens over the weekend, and uh, we'll talk soon about it uh, at, at greater length. In the meantime, I'm out. I'll see you later. Peace. <laughs> Just the Worst Podcast, episode number 14, has been a presentation of Just the Worst Podcast.